Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute uh, privilege and honour for me to be here speaking with yourselves. Um, a little bit about myself before I, I sit down. I was, um, as a young boy, I was extremely dyslexic. And for me, rugby became my happy place. It became my escape. And it allowed me to be the place where I could flourish and really gain confidence. In doing so, I went into the Harlequins Academy when I was 17 with your own, very own George Robson here, um, which was fantastic. I then went on to captain the club through the most successful period in the club's history. And again, now co-captain in the club, which I'm extremely honoured about. I went on to captain England on only my second appearance, becoming the most cap captain of the professional era. In doing so, we've had some tremendous highs, but also some of the darkest lows I can imagine, which I'm sure we'll touch a bit on later. Today I'm still playing, still enjoying my rugby, and like I said, honoured to be here. So I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much for being here today. I wanted to start by asking about when you started to play rugby. You began at the age of seven. When did you realise that this was something that you wanted to play professionally? Yeah, like you said, I, I was playing rugby from a very young age and similar to a lot of you in the room, I imagine, an age which it was just all I wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to go out there with my friends. My mum would take me and my brothers down to the rugby club on a Sunday and we would play, I think, more to give her a bit of peace and quiet than rather than develop our rugby. <laughs> Um, but it wasn't to actually, when, when I started playing rugby, it wasn't on the TV as much as it is now. There wasn't as much coverage. It wasn't in all the papers. You would just get the odd game on the Six Nations and stuff and that at the BBC. So for me, going into the Harlequins Academy structure, I didn't really know what to expect. I kind of used it as a bit of a gap year. And then I was like, I'll give it a go. I'll defer my university and just see what happens. So for myself, um, I managed to get kept on and kept on and kept going. But early on in my career, I had some significant injuries. I, I broke my foot twice. I broke my leg. I did my knee ligaments. I broke my hand, broke the other hand. Um, and all of a sudden, you're thinking, is this game really for me? <laughs> I remember speaking to my mum after that, and she was like, typical motherly advice. She was like, well, why don't you just drink more milk? And I was like, <laughs> so I was like thanks, mum. But it was only at kind of that, that point when you thought, actually, I, I could make it. I was... I was a good player as a kid, don't get me wrong, uh, but I wasn't one of the exceptional guys. I probably developed a little bit later. Um, and then once you get your opportunity, you've just got to grab it with both hands. So were there ever points where you thought you were going to quit and sort of do something else? Or was it something that you always had in mind as your goal? No, for, for me, I, I can't imagine myself in a classroom um, or an office working a nine to five. For me, I've, I've loved sport, um, in particular rugby. And like I said, it was something I've always wanted to do throughout my career or throughout my life. Uh, I wanted to be out there with my friends playing. Um, and even when I'm sat at home, I'm, just, I'm always up, I'm always about. I can't really sit still, which drives my missus mad. Um, but again, I want to, want to be active. Um, but no, I've never, never had that moment to give it up yet. Um, you mentioned the highs and lows of your career earlier. Which of the matches that you've played are the ones that stand out as the most memorable and <coughs> why? Yeah, I, I think for myself, from a club point of view, um, I, I supported Harlequins as a young kid. I had a top um, going through the academy, captain in the club is, is winning the premiership with, with George as well. Something the club has never, ever done, uh, which was an incredible honour to go out there and, and see Twickenham with so many kind of Harlequin shirts in there. I think from an England point of view, to be named England captain um, was something as, as a young boy, I would have, it would have been beyond my dreams. Um, to get there. I dreamt about playing for England. I never dreamt about going that far. And, and for me, it was such an honour. There were some, of course, key moments. My first game as captain, going up to Scotland, winning up there, lifting the Calcutta Cup, um, almost dropping it from Princess Anne as well, which was a bit worrying. Um, but then also the likes of beating New Zealand, a son which not many English players have ever had the opportunity to do. And very lucky that we had Manu Tuilangi that day because he was incredible. And I think... <laughs> He was running over Dan Carter, McCaw, all this lot, and I think without him we may have struggled. Um, but I remember that game, and we, uh, we had got an incredible start. I think we had gone, gone about 15-0 up at half-time, and Dan Carter missed a bit of a kick. And to beat a side like that, you need luck, because they're very good sides. And I just remember came out after half-time, we were kind of, we were, all you quite young guys, we were all pumped and ready to go again. And they scored all two tries extremely quickly. And you just heard the whole of Twickenham go, oh. 
And it's a bit like, you know, when like a winger drops the ball and you just have that sense. So it was, um, but no, we managed to win it and it was, yeah, definitely one of those days. Um, and about the failures in general in your matches, a lot of the sports players who come to talk to the union talk about the importance of having a mentality of winning. But on the other hand, what importance do you think failure has in the larger path towards success? Yeah, well, no, I think it's... I think it's tough and, and failure in sport is so so open, it's so well viewed, it's everyone has their opinions on it and stuff and it was it's extremely tough. I've I've been in some tough games where we've lost Grand Slam games, we've of course the World Cup at home, which was some of my darkest times, um, which you'll be in writing written about in the press. You've got kind of paparazzi outside your house, um, you feel ashamed, you don't want to go out. I became a bit of a hermit to be honest. I didn't want to leave the house. And but you grow from these, it takes time. And I remember Sean Fitzpatrick, who I know you guys had come speak to you a while ago. He, um, he emailed me the day after the World Cup and after we had just lost to Australia. So we lost to Wales, which on a decision of mine as well, played a huge influence in it. And then we lost to Australia as well the following week. And I remember going back to my room that night with, with my wife and we just held each other and cried. And we just cried and we cried and we cried. And then I woke up the next day to an email from Sean Fitzpatrick and he said, you probably feel like shit at the moment. And I did. And nothing anyone says or does is going to help you. But a sun will come up. It might not be tomorrow. It might not be next week. It might not even be next month. But it will come up again and things will be okay. And sometimes you just need time. And I needed a lot of time in that instance. And, and there is still stuff where it plays in me and I'll wear that scarf for the rest of my life. But you learn from stuff like that. And now I can use those experiences to help people. There was, there was another instance after that as well. We went to Buckingham Palace. All the captains and all the coaches from the World Cup had to go and meet the Queen, which, which was an incredible honour. Um, never met the Queen. It was, it was uh, brilliant. But you could see myself and Stuart were hurting. We didn't really want to be there. We were putting on a brave face. And you could feel the pity from the other players, the other coaches. We'd just gone out. Um, they were still in the World Cup, obviously. And a guy called Heineken Mayer, the South African coach, who... I, I hadn't really met, we'd crossed paths, we'd played each other a couple of times. Just saw me walking past and as he saw me, he grabbed me on both, both our shoulders and just looked me dead in the eye and just said, you're too strong to let this affect you. And I think those two showing me that courage, these are two guys I didn't know particularly well. They didn't have to do anything, but they could see I was hurting. And I think for that now, being an older, older player, being a more experienced player, is helping guys. Someone like Carl Sinclair, who, after the Wales game this year, again, wrongly, got a bit of a hammer in front of the media, a bit of the press, whatever, although he played extremely well, is speaking to guys like that, because you understand. Um, and when I was struggling, it was listening to people who had been through these situations before. It's all well and good, your mates saying, oh, things are going to be OK, you'll be fine. But they, they have no idea what you're feeling. They have no idea the attention you have in the media speculation, whatever or the weight on your shoulders. Um, so to hear from other international captains, people who have been through that is a key part of me. And I think that shows leadership, knowing, don't rely on someone else to do something. Take responsibility for yourself. And I know this, this week in particular is, is Mental Health Awareness Week and stuff. And it's a huge, it's a huge issue in sport at the moment. Um, and you don't always see what's going on with people, but I think just being there for people Taking time out your of your schedule, go for a coffee, go for a, probably a pint more in your, in your schedules. But just being there and helping people, and that is something those two in particular taught me a massive life lesson. So leading on from that, to talk about your leadership, uh, what aspects of the tran transition of being a team member to being the captain of the team did you find the most difficult and the most rewarding? Um, rewarding, lifting trophies. It's always, uh, that's quite nice. Um, for, for me, I was, again, I was a young captain when I was at Harlequins, I was 24. When I was England, I was doing up my second appearance when I was 25 years old. At times, you're captaining guys and leading guys 10 plus years older than yourself who've got a lot more experience than you. And I, and I thought for myself, and you can't pick and choose your days as a captain. You have to go in there and as a leader, you can't pick and choose. You have to make sure you go in there every single day and deliver. You might have had an argument with your missus, you might have had road rage coming in into training or whatever it be, but you can't let that affect you. You might, you might be a little bit sore, but every time you have to go out there to train and you have to deliver. 
and that was a massive thing I, I strived on. Um, I'm probably not the most vocal guy as a captain, um, but you, you learn those things as well. But I thought one thing I could lead with and kind of really start well with was that work ethic and making sure I brought it every single day. Moving in a different direction, um, banning contact rugby in schools is an issue that's been spoken a lot about recently. Uh, what are your views on this topic? Um, I don't think they should. I think for, for young guys, I think the key thing for them is being taught technique properly. I think if all of a sudden they've not had contact training at such a young age when realistically their bodies don't weigh too much, um, they're not that big, the collisions aren't as big, it's better to teach them at that age. All of a sudden, if they haven't done that, and then it, they start doing it at 15, 16 years old, when guys are bigger, quicker, faster, stronger, the collisions are bigger, therefore you're asking for trouble, I think. All of a sudden, if you've done that tackle technique throughout the years, building up, each player's getting a little bit bigger as well, collisions bigger, then once you get to that age and become men or women, um, you have proper technique and are used to it. Whereas I think if you get rid of it, I think you're going to get a lot more issues later on in life, or later on in your career, I should say. Um, and then also I wanted to ask about the World Rugby's plan changes to the global rugby calendar. As these gather pace, what are your thoughts on these changes? The world calendar? Um, I don't know if I'll be playing when they're happening. Um, I, I think look, they're, they're trying to make the game better. I think it's, it's not ideal at the moment. From a Northern Hemisphere point of view, our season just seems to be getting longer. And I don't think anyone wants to budge. Well, uh, look, international games don't want to give up on games. Club rugby doesn't want to give up on games. But at the moment, it's just the same season, but longer. I think for, for improvements for player welfare, player development, then there's got to be less games. Uh, and whether that comes on a club or an international fixture. But as a player, you want to play in everything. You want to go out there and play for your country as much as possible. You want to be playing for your club, especially in the big games. So it's about someone budging, but at the moment, no one's willing to. Mm. And as you mentioned, uh, this is Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, what, in your opinion, is the importance of mental health in sport? And, and how do you bring this out as captain of the team? Yeah, me mental health's, uh, uh, and it's probably the hardest one to identify with. Um, a lot of guys, we've had issues in the past, and, and in particular when guys are injured. Because when you're injured, you're training on your own, you're, you're eating on your own, you're not going to meetings, you're not doing the rugby, you're not with your mates and doing the bits you love. Um, and a lot of guys get extremely depressed in these times. And it's, it's then for them having avenues outside of the game. Mm -hmm. And I think the guys who, who probably don't and they put too much on their rugby, that they don't have that escape away from it. So for those guys, it's, it's getting a break. But we have a psychologist at the club, we have a psychologist with England. And, and again, it's, like I said, it's being there for people going for a coffee here and there, just chatting. And I think, I think the game today is a lot more open than it used to be. And I think the world is a lot more open in terms of, I'm sure a lot of you guys said to one of your friends, I'm having issues with this or that. They would be there for you. And I think that's a brilliant thing about rugby. Yes, if you do something stupid, they'll take the mick out of you and you'll be laughed at for the rest of the year. But in the more important things, the bigger issues, people are there for you. Um, and that's always what I've found. Mm. And you mentioned the importance of having avenues outside the game. For yourself, how do you escape? Yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky. I've, I've got a couple of businesses I'm involved with. I've got a, a couple of coffee shops, an event business, a soup brand, which, again, I'm not going to be in there fully, but I like to know what's going on and have that interaction that when I get to post rugby, I have that opportunity and I know what to do. <laughs> um, but a big escape for me is, and it's, a lot of guys, it's playing with their kids or little things like that. For me, it's leaving my phone at home and. Mm -hmm. Me and my wife taking the dog for a walk and just getting away, just switching off for an hour um, and escaping that kind of reality. Um, and a lot of guys have some crazy things. I'm not saying coaching is, but a lot of guys coach. You get guys who fly helicopters or planes or ran. Luke Wallace goes and mountain biking and all this kind of stuff. So there, there's something for everyone. Just find out what your one is. And with the businesses that you have, what made you decide to, to start them and to continue working with them? Um, just more opportunities and stuff I'm interested in. Um, as you can imagine, as, as rugby players, we sit around drinking a lot of coffee in our spare time. Um, so it kind of made sense for that. Events, I think it's something I will go into. Um, and I enjoy that side of things. I enjoy seeing an idea and then seeing people enjoy it. 
and a little stages in between. Like I said, I don't think I'm going to be in an office fully, but to <coughs> mix and max, interact, that kind of networking side of things. Um, and the suit brand, just a, a good opportunity came up. Um, and we all like to look smart, don't we? So, so. Do you think you're going to expand more into business in the future? I think so. I, I've come from a very business orientated family, so it's always been something we've, we've spoken about as a family and, and various bits. And, and as you know, as a rugby player, you earn well, but you don't earn enough to retire and go sit on a beach. So you have to find that next career. And we actually have people at the club now whose sole responsibility is to get you that work experience, to help you get degrees, um, to get you outside of the game and to help you grow. So that unfortunately, when that does come, you are ready for it. So on that note, before moving on to questions from the audience, I wanted to ask what's next for you and where do you see yourself headed in the next few years? Next for me. Um, of course, my, we've got a massive end to the season with, with Harlequins this weekend. So hopefully if we win that game and results go away, we're going to a semi-final for the first time in about five years. So that'll be huge for the club. Um, I'm working extremely hard to get into the England reckoning again and go to the World Cup because that's going to be massive. Um, and I want to have another shot on that, especially after what happened last time and, um, and try to reduce that scar a little bit. But in terms of the future, again, I'm not 100% I'm not sure yet. Um, is it a worrying thing? Not particularly. I think it's quite exciting. The next chapter of life and there's a lot of guys and, and I'm sure at stages there will come a bit of a balance in that where I have to probably put rugby on the back burner and look at a new career. But at the moment it's very much rugby focused and making the most of that. Um, who knows, I could be with you guys next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we can move on to audience questions. So if you have a question, please put your hand up and the mic will come to you. Thanks very much, Chris, for being here. Um, I'm a South African, so it was great to hear your story about Heineken Mayer. Um, I wanted to ask you a question um, I know it may be difficult for you to answer, but about the recent comments uh, that Israel Folau has made um, about uh, homosexuality um, and his uh, the fact that he's a pretty well-known rugby player. Um, and if you've had to deal with anything in your captaincy, or if you know of any issues around sort of uh, LGBTI rights within the rugby community, if it's a conversation that's being had, or do you think should be had uh, going forward? Um, cheers, man. It's awesome to uh, uh, listen to you today. Nice to meet you as well. Um, yeah, look, I don't support his views in the, in, uh, in the slightest. And I think with... And look, I'm not going against religion because there are a lot of people out there and I think you have to be respectful. And I think especially when you get to that, that level of where he is, you have to be respectful and own what you said. And look, he's owned it. He's, he's taken the consequences or whatever it be. But I think as a sport, we pride ourselves in being open to everyone whether that's shape, size, religion, sexuality, whatever it be, we want to be that sport. And I think for him to say something like that was hugely damaging and I've got a, a lot of gay friends who were quite hurt by that. Um, but again, as a sport, and I think as world sport has shown, they're, they're not standing for it. He's, lo he's lost contracts and stuff like that. In terms of how, have I had to deal with stuff like that? Um, not to that extent, but yeah, we, we've had issues with players, no, nothing quite like that, but going out and causing trouble on nights out or things like that, which again, as, as a captain, as a senior guy, you have to sit down with them. Young guys, you need to be set in their ways. I think with camera phones today, with social media, it's a huge element which 15 years ago, the players were going out the night before a game and not caring, whereas uh, the game's changed. Um, society's changed. Um, and these young guys, whether they want to be or not, they are role models to young kids coming through. Um, they need to show, like I said, rugby in the best possible light, but also themselves. And that doesn't mean you can't have fun, you can't muck around, but it's just about showing that respect and having core values about yourself. Can we go to the hand in the back? Um, I can't really think of, well, I can only think of one openly gay rugby player, and he's retired now. Do you think rugby has a problem with homophobia? Uh, I, I, I don't know, to be honest. And I, I think with rugby at the moment as well, we're in a, a tricky situation. 
And I think there's a very fine line to have where, as rugby players, supporters, whatever, we're, we get on our a high horse a bit. We think our grass is greener than others sometimes. When you're looking at football and whatever else, and with these comments recently, with every Premiership club making a loss by one, the RFU making a huge loss, I think rugby's in a bit of a dangerous, dangerous time. Uh, and I think we need to be careful. We need to make sure we keep looking after s ourselves. We need to be sustainable. Otherwise, we'll, clubs will go bust like Leeds recently have. They've gone back to a part-time club just because they don't have the funding there. Um, so I think we're in a very tricky crossroads as, a, as an organisation at the moment. Thanks. Uh, hi. Um, so you've you played with a lot of, a lot of modern-day legends, played with and against, uh, and Robbo. Is there, is, there, is there anyone out there playing now that you've not been on the turf with that you'd like to either play with or play against? Um, I've never actually played with Bowden Barrett, or obviously never played against Bowden Barrett, and he looks an incredible player at the moment. Um, someone, someone who's always impressed me from a young age, Owen Farrell. And I've, I've been lucky enough to play with him a lot, and you see him really develop into the leader he is at the moment, uh, the player he is. You, I remember from a young age, Owen Farrell was coming into the England side and kind of bossing guys around and telling guys what he wanted. And for me, you, you take him out of any side and the volume of training drops by about 80%. He's that vocal, he knows what he wants, he's demanding standards. Um, and then off the pitch, he's, he's quite relaxed and quiet, but on the pitch, he's, he's that leader. And for me, he's, he's probably the best player I've played with in terms of that. Um, so, yeah. Can we go to the hand in the second row? In terms of, right, so you spoke about Owen Farrell um, and his you know, abilities on the pitch and his training ethic and stuff. Uh, I mean, I've seen it a few times watching him play and sometimes he loses his cool for a bit and he, he shoulder barges someone or you know, sticks his hand out or something stupid and he loses his cool. Like, do, you think, you know, do you think that's something he really needs to work on? Do you think it's sort of a, a, you know, a byproduct of his, you know, his mindset and his actual like, ability to play and stuff? I, I think with that, it's... I, look, I don't think he, he's meaning to do that. I just think the intent he's going at, he's, he's got that similar mindset to Johnny Wilkinson, where when he's tackling, he's going for people. He doesn't want to be a 10. It just soaks and makes his tackles. He even knocks them back. And like, unfortunately, he got a couple wrong. Um, but I don't, I don't think he's a malicious player at all. I think he brings an intensity. And, and like you said, sometimes wanting to win that much, being that desperate to, to achieve that, I think potentially maybe that's... That's something, but that's not a bad thing to have in him, I think. Can we go to the hand in the fourth row? Hey Chris, thanks for your time today. Um, sort of a two-part question for you. You said that you're quite a young captain um, when you came into the England setup. Um, what impact did the captaincy, I guess when you were that young, but just the captaincy in general, have on your sort of put your own individual performance um, and mentality? And then I guess the second part of that is, you know, transitioning into, you know, being a player that isn't a captain in that mm. squad. How did you kind of handle that in terms of your own performance? Yeah, um, I think firstly, when, you, when I went into captain, I had to isolate myself a bit. I think as a, as a captain, you need to be able to call people out. You need to be able to separate yourself. If you play badly or done something stupid, I need to tell you. And I'm not going to hold that against you, but I need to be strong enough to do it. And it can be a lonely place at times. Um, but you need to be strong enough to deal with that. And for me, it was, it was developing that type of style. Um, and a lot of it was trial and error, in all honesty. Like I said, I hadn't done a lot. I was trying to read books. I was trying to talk to people. Like I said, I talked, sp spoke to Sean Fitzpatrick, spoke to Will Carling, who was a very young captain of England as well. Um, but even just speaking to Stuart Lancaster, Conor O'Shea at Harlequins at the time, and trying to get these guys' advice. We were actually very lucky we had a Andy Farrell, as our defence coach. And he, ca he captained Great Britain for Rugby League when he was about 20 years old. So he was someone I used to bounce ideas off a little bit and um, he was brilliant. In terms of how I dealt with the other side, for when I came out of being captain, I was probably not in the best place. There was a lot of pressure on me. I, was, I probably didn't think I was gonna play for England again after the World Cup, um, let alone be captain. And it was being played out in the press kind of daily, weekly. Should he be captain? Should he be playing this person, that person, whatever? And it was, it was a lot for me. 
And I went and, I went and saw Eddie, Eddie Jones. We had a good chat when he first came in. And he said, if I can go away and do two or three things, there'll be a place for me in his side. So I went away, worked on my game and played play quite well. Um, I managed to get called into the Six Nations. He said, look, mate, you're going to start. You're going to be my number six. But we've got a new team and a new captain. And I said, thank God. Uh, I was at that stage, I'd, I'd done it for four years. The, the burden had probably got to me. The way things had finished had played a, a big part of me and I wouldn't have been the right man to lead it if he had said. Um, he, he almost put me out of my misery in terms of that. that I was so, had that, not a fear, but that scar was so big and so raw. Um, that was the best thing for me. And I think for me then going as a player, I then had the respect for the captain of what he needed, I felt. I'd been there, I'd been in the tough things where guys might be saying something or, or things aren't quite going right and trying to help him as best as possible. Because I know it could be a tough place, I know it could be a lonely place. And just like I said, whether it's going for a coffee with him or just giving him that extra bit of support in training or helping him with a role somewhere. Um, and just like I said, just being there for people. Um, and again, just doing your job to the best of your ability. Because as a captain, you don't want to have to worry about individuals turning up day in, day out. Especially with England, people just turn up. They know every day they're on it. They've got to deliver it, which is great. When you go back to the club, it's probably a little bit more demanding in terms of those standards. But I'm just t trying to support him as best as I could. Can we go to that? Um, touching on the, the scar of 2015, um, sorry to bring it back up, but um, what went wrong exactly, do you think? What are the key issues that meant that it was such a disappointing campaign? Yeah, look, I think we, we didn't become a bad side overnight. We blinked at the wrong time, unfortunately. Of course, you look at that Wales game, the decision I made, unfortunately, it, it went against us. Um, but going into the press, then playing Australia, which was probably one of the best sides I've ever faced, and we, we weren't at our best. And then going into a press conference, which was probably trebly the amount of people in the room from here, cameras flashing about five minutes after the game, being one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. I was just like, I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to break down. I'm not going to give them that satisfaction. And that was, that was tough. I mean, that was one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life, go and do that and face them. Um, but in terms of what went wrong exactly, I'm, I'm not 100% sure. And do you think... Um do you think we're ready for this, this campaign coming up? Yeah, definitely. I think England, especially <coughs> in the Six Nations recently, even though they didn't win it, they showed how dangerous they are. And look, we had a, a bit of a blip against Scotland in the second half at the end, unfortunately. But I think you see the potential of what they went and did in Dublin. That England performance was one of the greatest we've, we've probably seen. Um, and I think on their day, they can hurt anyone. It's just making sure it's their day. And I think for us in 2015, we didn't make sure it was our day every day. Um, and that's what hurt us. <laughs> got, got a follow up. Uh, you, know, you said Eddie asked you to go away and work on a couple of things. Would you, would you mind sharing those with us? Or was that a bit too close? Uh, there's, there's some things I'll keep to myself. Roger. <laughs> <laughs> On, uh, on James Haskell's retirement, you said not bad for two, six and a half. Has that frustrated you a bit that you've been labelled as that for quite a lot of your career? Uh, not, not really, in all honesty. I think as, look, as a young player, you probably care about things, you stress about things, you, you care what X, Y and Z is writing about you. He's probably never played a game of rugby in his life. Um, and as, as you get older, your skin gets thicker. You learn to listen to the people that that matter, the coaches, your teammates and stuff like that, the people who actually have an effect on the team. Um, for me, I, that was um, a brilliant thing that before Eddie Jones came in, he described me and James Haskell as, as two six and a half at best, um, which it was an idea when the new manager coming in is not be too complimentary of yourself. Um, so that was a bit daunting. And after myself and James, I played six, he played seven. We, we just won the Grand Slam in, in France, in Paris that year. And he just winked at me in a weird way. I was like, what are you doing? He goes, just wait. I was like, okay. Just completely forgot about it. And he had arranged with a kit man to get two six and a half shirts made up. So of course, we got, and it being a joke of years, we got them out. And I said, what would have happened if we lost? 
no one would have ever known. <laughs> they, would have, uh, they would have been burnt on the way out. Um, so look, uh, he's, he'll be a loss for the game, James Haskell. Um, he's a guy, again, I've played with since, since being at school. Um, a great guy to have. Um, the character of the guy. Um, but he gets a lot of stick for his off-field activities, but I've never seen a guy train harder than himself. He, he always wants to be better, whether that's kind of fitness, mobility, training, whatever it be, he always wants to improve himself and rugby's always been his, his biggest asset. But unfortunately, that day comes when you've got to call it a day. Um, but yeah, he'll be missed. Cheers. Um, looking forward to the World Cup, do you have a favourite team that isn't England? <coughs> What to play or to watch or either actually or both. <laughs> um, you, you want to watch your good sides, don't you? You want you want to play them as well. As a as a young lad, I always wanted to to play in the big stadiums against the best sides, and and with with world rugby and international rugby, you get that opportunity. And for me, international rugby is a funny one because. People see you on a Saturday, but they don't see everything that kind of goes on in the week, whether you've got a knock from the week before, you've got, you're doing physio kind of every hour of the day, you're doing recovery, you're training extremely hard, you're doing appearances, you've got media, you've got that type of pressure. But then you get to the stadium and you see the bars of everyone. And for that 100 minutes, you get to do what you love, and that's just play rugby against the other best players in their country, the best 15 in your country, if you're the best 15 in their country. And all that gets forgotten about everything else, the sideshow, whatever it is, gets forgotten and you just play rugby. Because then as soon as you finish that game, you've got a camera in your face, you've got the media there, you're off to see the sponsors, you're going to functions with the RFU, all this kind of stuff, and the cycle continues. But for that, whatever it is, 100 minutes, you get to in properly love it again and um, remind yourself, this is why you play. Um, you've spoken a lot about media attention that you've gotten. What advice would you give to younger players rising up on how to deal with this constant attention? Yeah, it's, um, it's a, funny that, a funny one, that, because I think with social media and all that kind of stuff, like you said, online stuff now, you, you probably can't really escape stuff. Um, and I think there's a lot of stuff out there which, look, like I said, as you get older, your skin gets thicker, your shoulder gets broader, and you learn what to listen to. As a young player, you, you take it all in, you absorb it, um, and it can affect you, and it can affect you, but it's, it's not saying that stuff doesn't hurt, but it's trying to pay attention to what the important information is, whether that's getting off social media, whether that's staying away from reading stuff. Um, it's tough. It's a, it's a tough place to be. And whether it's just talking to someone about it or talking to someone who's been through it before and using that experience, that I think is what's key. Um, sharing those emotions, sharing those feelings because it's not an easy place to be. And I think until you've actually witnessed it, you don't really have an idea how it feels. So now if I see another international captain or coach or manager or whatever going through stuff, you, you know how it feels and it, it's not a nice thing. And how would you say the increased social media has changed, if it has at all, the game in the past few years and the way it affects the players? Um, I, th I think for the better and, and, and the worse. It's, I think social media is brilliant. Um, but again, and every man and his dog can have their opinion if it's not a good one. But I think with, with a lot of social media, most of it's good, but you've just got a 5 10%, which is bad. Mm -hmm. So why, if you're getting so stressed about a 5 10%, why not just look at the positives? And it's just switching your attention to as as humans, I think we're drawn to the negatives. We want to solve that quickly. We're we're involved in that, but again, it's just trying to brush that aside and, and stick on the positives and keep up with that mental mindset. And what other changes have you seen in the game over the past years that you think have been either positive or negative? I, I think the game has changed hugely just in in my time, and I've been playing about fifteen years or so. I think the game's got so much quicker, the guys got fitter and faster. I think you look at forwards and they're probably still the same size. You look at backs and they're like the size of forwards now um, and pretty quick. Um, I was saying upstairs, some of you got props like Julian White, who didn't want to touch a rugby ball, just wanted to scrum a ball and that's it. And if they touch a ball, they thought they had a bad game because they were in the wrong place. 
But you look at tight head props like Carl Sinclair now, who are making 20, 30 meter breaks, doing kick chase, tackling, carrying, um, even kicking every now and then. Um, so yeah, the game's changed hugely and I think it's just going to continue to change. In 10 years time, when I'm well and truly gone from the game, uh, I'll look back and it'll be a completely different game to what I played. Do you, can you predict any of the changes that you think will happen over the next 10 years? Um, there's one change I would like to see, and that's whoever scored the try had to kick. Yes. Would, uh, <laughs> I always think that would be a good fun. Look, I don't, I don't know about the proper, proper changes, but I think that would always get a bit of value, and then as forwards we'd be allowed to practice some kicking, which is nice. <laughs> And are there any other questions from the audience? Can we go right to the back, please? Who's harder, Ellis Genge or Carl Sinclair? <laughs> God, good question, actually. Uh, I don't know, I think they would just keep running into each other, to be honest. Uh, I wouldn't like to be in the middle of it, that's for sure. Did, did you have a question? Can we go to the sixth row? There's been talk, or there always is talk, about ring fencing the Premiership, with this season being one of the most competitive to stay in. What are your thoughts on that? I think ring fencing's uh, a funny one. Um, I think you've probably only got one team from the league below who could realistically come up and compete. Obviously, London Irish this year, Newcastle have gone down them, I think. In terms of backing, in terms of financial stability, in terms of the criteria of what you need to play in the Premiership, but also I think with playing in the Premiership, the fear of relegation puts in you. The way you have to scrap for every single point, every single week. Otherwise, I think you get to this stage of the year, towards the end, guys would start looking at their holidays and being like, let's just get through games. And they don't become as desperate. They're probably not as important. They're probably not as great to watch for the spectators. Um, and you take away that kind of incentive. So I, I can see both sides of it. But I think keeping relegation, look, it's not ideal because you get clubs, people lose their jobs, unfortunately, and all this stuff, and it's not brilliant. Um, but I think the people in the leagues below need to have that aspiration to try and achieve that. And I think as the premiership size, we need to have that fear to keep on battling every single week. We go to the front row. So um, when you're on the field, would you say there's anything that scares you? I remember when we were about 21 years old, just coming to the Quinn setup or whatever, thinking, yeah, I'm, pr I'm pretty good. I've kind of made it, you know, I'm quite happy. Um, and it's 22, we played Sail Sharks away, who were a pretty good side back then. And we kicked this 22 off, and the ball just went all the way to a guy called Sebastian Chabal, which for those that don't know Sebastian Chabal, looks like a six foot five caveman. <laughs> well, you probably saw him at a seven singing, what was he singing? 100 miles, yeah, exactly. Uh, known for his rugby day. Uh, and he was a pretty big man. And he just looked me dead in the eye and just ran. He had about a 20 meter run up. I was looking around, anyone? Anyone? No. And he just ran straight over the top of me and I woke up in the change room. Um, so yeah, he, he scared me. Uh, but no, there are, yeah, look, there are, there, are there are tough characters out there to play against. Um, and there are some big ones. I think with cameras and stuff and sightings and all that, you probably don't get a lot of the niggle you used to get um, in terms of cheap shots and all that stuff, which has made the game a lot cleaner, a lot faster, a lot safer. Um, but yeah, there have been times running into a couple of them. <laughs> Can we go to the hand on the left? Going back to those 100 minutes when you get to play rugby and do what you love, would you say that you change when you're on a rugby pitch and that rugby brings out a different side of you? Yeah, I think so. I, I, and I think it has to be. I think the, the physicality, the aggression, you, you need to have that buzz that when you go on the pitch or that kind of speed, that, in, that, that intensity in your mind, you're not taking that home and being like that at home because you'd be a disaster. I'd be ripping all these books off the wall, which I'd be in trouble about. Um, yeah, of course, of course, you've got to get in the right mindset to go out there and play. Because um, if not, they've got that mindset and they're going to do what Shabal did to me. Um, so yeah, you definitely have to have a mindset that when you go into the pitch, you are like that. Because if not, you're probably going to be out there causing trouble. 
did you have a question as well? So, so obviously, um, in, in the game, so obviously I've played with, played with you on a number of occasions, but in, in the games you've got moments of massive intensity and then there might be a bit of downtime whether you're talking to the guys or whatever else. Um, are there any moments now where you actually look around and go, wow, this is pretty amazing? Or have there been moments in your career where you've looked up in, in some of these, you know, the, some of these stadiums, I suppose maybe the anthems or whatever, when you've actually just taken it in? Because um, from my own experience, sometimes you you just forget all that stuff and you just concentrate, like you just said. Are there any moments you can think of, or recently, or any time in your career where you've taken it actually in in the moment? Yeah, I think um, I think during the game, you're always in the moment. You don't. People say, do you hear this guy shouting or something? You, unless it's quite quiet, you normally don't because there's normally quite a, a loud kind of buzz coming. We recently played Clermont away um, and their stadium is probably the best club stadium I've ever played. They all wear yellow, it's probably about 30,000 people. The, when the kickers are kicking, we're quite respectful here. They're all kind of clapping, that's just their thing. The noise it created was incredible. But I think the national anthems for me was something I always love doing as a kid i would always run in and sing the national anthems at home and you want to be there you see the likes of delario and richard hill and all these type of guys and you think that's where you want to be and i think as a, an international to be there now because normally your family also sat sat in the rows in front of you so you can see them as well which is always a nice feeling um, but to sing that there's something very proud when you sing at twickenham eighty thousand people singing the national anthem it's um, there aren't many better feelings so going back to the question about what scares you, or if there's anything that scares you on the field, do you have a fixed routine that you use to prepare for games that you think will be particularly difficult? Um, I like to have a bath before every game. The night before, I have a bath. <laughs> I just, uh, I think it relaxes me, it helps me, helps me sleep. Um, but yeah, look, I think with, superstitions are a funny one because no superstition lasts forever. Uh, but it's hard telling people that and it's hard as a player understanding that as well. Um, I've seen people do ridiculous things. I won't say who it was, but playing for England, um, I looked over to my right there and there was a guy sat like this, filing his nails. <laughs> I kid you not. Uh, and we were like, what are you doing? And he's like, each to their own. So, that, so that was the weirdest one I've seen. <laughs> Um, and then before finishing off with the event, um, I wanted to go back to what you said about your businesses. Are there any skills that you've learned from rugby that you use to, that you transfer in working in business? Yeah, I think, I think so. And we actually get a lot of rugby players going into the city and all that type of stuff because we're very good at working in a team environment. Like I'm sure a lot of you are, you work in a team environment under pressure daily in training. Every, every weekend, and how do you get the best out of people? You understand people, you understand your teammates, you understand I can't speak to you the way I speak to you, to you, to you. Um, and it's reacting like that. And I think with, with business and work, and I'm sure a lot of you in the room know, it's a lot of people skills. It's doing business with people you like, people you get on with, but also people who are gonna get the best out of you. And I think with being a leader, being a team player, that's a huge role. How can you make someone better? And in the workplace or on the field, that was a, a massive thing for me. We had a guy at the club who kept dropping the balls. He dropped the balls all the time. So I said to him, okay, every day after training, I'll do 10 passes with you. If you're not here, we'll do 20 tomorrow. And if you muck me around, we're done. So every day we did 10 passes and we kept on building. And what happened, his hands get, got better. It didn't take a long time out of my day. It took me 30 seconds at the end of training. But we made that pact to him. Again, I, I seek him out to try and help him. And that's, that's what I think a lot of rugby players are like. They have those abilities to see people in trouble, see people that need help, uh, work in those team environments and help get the best out of people. So do you feel like being captain specifically has helped you in, in other areas of life? Massively, yeah, massively. I think, like, like, like I said up there, I was, I was a dyslexic, I was a shy, shy kid. Um, if you had told me as a kid I'd be doing something like this, I wouldn't have believed you. I, um, for me, one of the most daunting things for me as a child was standing up and reading the next paragraph. You know, as a kid, you all go through a paragraph, you read it each, you sit down. For me, that was one of my biggest fears. And for me now, rugby has given me that confidence to challenge myself. And, and that, that's a huge thing we speak about, it's being comfortable when you're uncomfortable. 
continuing to challenge yourself, continue to grow. We've done some, recently I went to a reading where I was reading in between Charles Dance, Olivia Coleman and Dawn French, mm -hmm. which I was like, oh my God, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> but again, it's, it's going out of my comfort zone and, and pushing myself. We had a guy, um, Conor O'Shea was our director of rugby at the time, and he was very much about challenging us in different ways. And we went on army camps, we did acting classes, we did all these kind of things. But one of the biggest ones we had, and one of the biggest fears we had, is we went and did a stand-up comedy routine. And I imagine if you went back and told the rest of your team you're going to do that next week, you'd have a lot of sick days. Mm -hmm. So what we would do, so the leadership group, or the older guys, went off to a pub in the morning, and we worked with a guy doing a load of ad lib, a load of technique work, and that evening, the rest of our team would come and watch, a, watch us do a two-minute stand-up comedy set having some beers as well, so they were heckling, um, which was pretty daunting. And I had one joke which lasted, and it was, I didn't realise I was dyslexic until I went to a toga party dressed as a goat. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it, was stuff like, it was stuff like that which we all had the biggest fear doing it, but after doing it, the confidence it gave you to, to yeah, OK, I've done that. I'm going to go try something else now, and I'm going to keep on pushing myself. And that's something I always want to do. I always want to keep on challenging myself because look, a lot of things don't come easy for myself or other people. Um, but there's no reason to say no to it then. So do you still feel that fear before speaking or is it something that you're genuinely comfortable with now? No, look, you, you, you get better with it. You learn to develop. You challenge yourself in different ways from a, from a smaller room to a bigger room to a, an even bigger room um, to a more pressured environment. Um, but it's not just doing stuff, it's like doing stuff with the businesses or uh, going to work for a charity. And a lot of people always say to me, oh, I don't have time. I have, I have kids, I have a business going, I have all this kind of stuff. And I was like, okay, just, just set yourself a challenge. What, what do your kids do? Oh, they do French at GCC. Okay, why don't you learn basic French with them? Again, it doesn't take a lot of time, but challenging yourself in different ways to, to make yourself better is um, a, key, a key thing, I think. So what new challenges have you Me? sort of set for yourself in the next year? Doing more stuff like this. So I'm doing public speaking in terms of actually, uh, I've just been working on a, a speech in terms of leadership, resilience, and a lot of things we've done, but rather than a Q&A, an and actual speech in itself. Um, so that's my next challenge. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I'm sure it'll go great. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the audience before we finish? Um, do you have any dark horses for the World Cup this year? Are Fiji going to stun us? Or well, seeing some of their players, they might. They look good, I'll tell you that. Um, I don't know. You, you never know with stuff like that because you've got to play well at the right time. Argentina always seem to be good in World Cups. Um, Fiji are always quite dangerous. Look, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, who knows? you just got to worry about yourself. Okay, that's all we have time for today, so please join me in thanking Chris Robshaw.